<laughs> uh, there we are. So Jamal Campbell is an earliest educator, earliest consultant and aspiring children's author. He has been in the industry for over 19 years. Uh, earliest is his speciality and he has worked in youth clubs, schools, been a mentor to many and has supported children with additional needs. Jamal is one of the UK's men in early years champions. He has been featured in the media due to his extensive experience and knowledge of the early years and quirky but effective practice. He has stood on numerous platforms and prestigious establishments as a keynote speaker at St. Mary's University, the University of East London and Bath Spa University, to name a few. We are really, really excited to be welcoming Liz and Jamal along today. So I'm going to hand the platform over to both of them and share my slides. Thank you so much, Shadow. I really appreciate that. It's nice to kind of hear the um, long introduction. I told you that I wasn't going to limit myself on what I was going to send you over. So it's good to hear it read out. Good afternoon to everybody who is here. Very excited to be here. Um, and I know that lots of you are eagerly anticipating what is going to be shared, as am I in sharing it. So this is no coincidence, me and Jamal both standing in black and white um, against walls, um, <laughs> looking somewhere I don't know where, not sure. Um, no, it wasn't an, an absolute coincidence that we happen to take photographs like this, but it sets the tone and it sets the mood. And it also gives you an indication to our personalities, sometimes smiley, sometimes solemn. Um, but as we go through this presentation, I think everything will start to become clear. So next slide, please, shall I? The focus for today, <clears throat> How does the culture of our early years spaces enable and foster an anti-racist approach, particularly during this time with regards to interactions, language and resources? So we are all aware of the time that we are living in. We are all aware that there are two pandemics happening. Number one, COVID. Number two, racism in no particular order. We could in fact say that both of these pandemics are happening simultaneously and both are first place. So we are aware of the time that we are living in, but we might not all be aware of how these things are impacting us. Of course, there's been a lot of talk in the media about disproportionately who is being impacted by COVID and who is not. So when we think about this as a focus, I want it to remain at the forefront of your minds as we go through these slides and also to not ignore the fact that me and Jamal are both black people. I am a black woman, Jamal is a black man. I also want you to be aware as we go through today and have a think about how many times you have had sessions, um, CPD, training, information sharing, somebody educating you who is a black person. I want you to think about that as we move forward because it is important. Next slide, please. Shadow's already done the introductions, but I also want to give an introduction to myself in my own words because it's really important that I take charge of the narrative. Of course, that bio was read out beautifully by Shadai, but I want to let you know why I am a former nursery manager. I want to let you know why I am a qualified secondary school teacher. I wanna let you know why I'm the director of an anti-racist training and consultancy company and why I state my intersection and my identity markers <clears throat> as a cisgender black woman, because these things set the context and it's really important we get to know each other. <sighs> Up until last year, March 2020, significant time because the first lockdown was announced. It was a significant time for all of us in the early years sector and for all of us who were disproportionately impacted by racism. Thinking about racism as something that is embedded, something that is structural as well as interpersonal. But being a black woman who worked for the black family business, the family business owned by my black mother started in 1987, we were not uh, hmm, shy of being impacted by structural racism, particularly within the early years, particularly within this sector that we are all a part of and we all talk about how kind this space is. Well, it depends on what side of the fence you are sitting on. 
So up until March 2020, I was a nursery manager and loved that dearly, obviously, as I said, part of the family business. So I had a vested interest, not just to the children and the families and the communities, but also to myself and my own family and thinking about the journey that my mother had taken to get to this point. Not ignoring the fact that local authorities, regulatory bodies, people who were sent in to help us did not always come to help us. Thinking about how we navigate this space as black women, how we navigate the space as a black mother and daughter team, and also how we spoke truth to power in the midst of making sure we had a family business. After lots of back and forths and meeting certain criteria and not meeting certain criteria and jumping through this hoop and jumping through that, we thought about how we were being impacted whilst the other nurseries didn't seem to be. We thought about what it meant when we were awarded an outstanding judgment and what it meant when we were awarded an inadequate. We started thinking about who were the families that we were serving, what did they look like, where were they coming from, and what was it that they were doing to ensure that they had a great time? What were we doing to ensure that they had a great time whilst they were in our nursery? So we thought about all of those things and carefully, carefully considered our intersections, our identity markers, where we sat, who we were and what we represented. Similarly, as I kind of went through um, my own experience of working within the sector, when I was a secondary school teacher, qualified as a secondary school teacher, started off as an unqualified secondary school teacher, I was very interested to see who was coming into the sector. So that is why I taught childcare and health and social care. It will be no surprise to any of you that I'm also a qualified drama school teacher. So I was very interested in all of these things and how it impacted the workforce because I wanted to know who was coming in and how they were encouraged to come into the sector and why. Thinking about setting up my own training and consultancy company was about just recognizing that there was a gap, there was a niche, there was something that wasn't quite happening in terms of enrolling and encouraging people to come into the sector and also coming into the sector with a full understanding of what was required. An absolute requirement of the understanding of anti-racist practice should be at the pinnacle and the core, at the foundation of anybody that's coming into work with children and families. I made sure that that was my mission, having experienced some of the things I had experienced to date. And thinking about myself as a cisgender black woman, that intersection was important because I wanted everybody to know from what perspective I was informing practice, what informed my pedagogy and what motivated me and why. Being aware of how I navigated that space was really, really important. So I always make it a, a point to, to stipulate, you know, that I am a cisgender black woman. Handing over to Jamal, if he would like to introduce himself. Yes, ma'am. Blessings, Liz. Blessings, blessings, blessings. Hello, people. Some of you might know me. Some of you may not. My name is Jamal Carly Campbell, and I'm a black man who's been in the early years for 19 years. Um, I kind of fell into the early years. As some of you may know, um, uncle of mine, he got me into youth work and told me to go and study. And after studying, well, during the time I was studying, um, I'd done a placement in a nursery and I never looked back, you know? Um, and what have I seen? What have I seen? What have I noticed? I've noticed that in a lot of settings, you know, I was the niche. I was the one and only. I stood out amongst my peers. Even as I studied my, my early years qualification, um, I was the only man and I was the only black man. And for a number of years, I was the, the early years, um, one of the advocates for men in the early years. And I remember sitting down at various conferences and hearing statistics, and there were no statistics about how many black men were in the early years. So I remember having a, a nice conversation with with Chadai and Chadai gave me some statistics and I was shocked. And it, it helped to, to, how do you say it, give me the fire in my belly to push and become a black man, an ambassador for black men in the early years. 
you know. Um, so I've, I've consulted, I've trained, I've, I've spoken on different platforms, as it said in my bio, and, and try to inspire and support my peers. I have called out those that I've seen displaying biased practice, not as a call out to, bias, um, to, to embarrass them, but a call out to say, look, you can do better. I've sat down on platforms with, with academics and known professionals and, and had conversations about inclusive practice and how we need to tear down these so-called traditional foundations that have been put in place because they're rubbish and help to build new ones. So that's a bit about me. Thank you, Jamal. Next slide, Blessed. please. <laughs> <laughs> so when we think about this we need to think about the style in which we're delivering you've got a flavor now for who we are what we do how we deliver and it might be something brand new to you this is good change is good we need to get used to the idea of change you need to get used to the fact that people that don't always look like you speak like you have come through the traditional roots like you may have don't have a voice because they do. And if we're working with all children, we're working with all families, we need to be truly representative of that within the workforce. But often we come across these hurdles and our latest hurdle as a society are conversations about the R word, race, racial prejudice, racism. Everybody wants to be very polite. Everybody wants to feel like if we speak about this, are we going to get it wrong? If we speak about this, are we in a position where we are comfortable with being challenged by people that don't look like us or don't speak like us? Here is the hard truth and facts. You need to be challenged. If you are racialized as white within this sector, you need to be challenged. Everything that you have constructed about the world that you live in will be challenged. And if it's not challenged by the children and the families that you work with, it will be challenged by an academic or a former nursery manager or a man in childcare who looks like me or Jamal. Because change has got to come, change is necessary, and you all, we all need it. So when we think about these three terms that I've put up here, I'm not going to go through it, but I want you to just spend some time to read it and see if it meets your understanding of what you thought it to be and also how it makes you feel as you see that. I'm assuming you're all here today because you know that you want to learn more and that's fine, but we almost, we always have to take on the responsibility of doing that learning ourselves as well as being facilitated or helped along the way by people like myself and Jamal. Race, racial prejudice and racism. Next slide, please. When I think about the time that I spent as a nursery manager, I think about the location that I was in. Some of you are here this afternoon from Birmingham. Some of you may know Birmingham and where the location of the nursery was in Edgebaston, or as I commonly say, sometimes it's referred to as Edgebaston. And that is because it sits on the border of two very different areas within the same area. And as you may have guessed, one area is very affluent, it's very middle class and it's very white. The other side of that area is not as affluent. Uh, there are things around social challenge, um, this term that we like to use, inner city, disadvantaged, which for me are words similar to like urban, which mean black and brown and marginalized and minoritized really interesting because my nursery sat in a very beautiful building owned by my mother, not rented, in a very beautiful building that sits on the Calthorpe estate. Those of you who don't know, please do your Googles, the Calthorpe estate, look at the history of the Calthorpe estate and think about the fact that a black woman owns that building. Bought that building in 1994 and proceeded to create two, by that point, two day nurseries. We then went on to have a third. But at that time, I created something called an ecosystem that I thought my children and families needed to thrive. My children and families needed an ecosystem to thrive against a backdrop and a foundation of racism. 
And it is really important that you acknowledge that as fact. We understand that we live in a racist society. We feel the impact of a racist society. And it was by no accident that it happened to be the majority of the children and the families that attended my nursery were black or brown. That wasn't because we advertised as a black nursery, which was really interesting because I remember receiving an email from somebody who had said, do you only accept black children? Is this nursery only for black children? And I thought really interestingly, with all the websites that I'd seen of nurseries up and down the land and the images that they would use would commonly always be white children and that they would have never received an email that said, do you only accept white children? So I thought about the ecosystem. I thought about the ecosystem for the families. You will see there's a picture of a group of people in the garden. They were our graduations. And every year we would have a graduation to represent to those black and brown and racially minoritized children that this was the end of part one. You're going on to part two. Part one being four years of early years education, four years of early years education tailored to meet their needs. Thinking about that graduation process, you'll see a picture of me in the middle there with a little boy who had lots and lots and lots of challenges. Not because there was anything wrong with him, but because he liked to ask a lot of questions as many children did. And he liked to also climb on windowsills. He liked to pull down blinds. He liked to kick people. And he also liked to punch. And we incorporated that within everything that we did because it was part of the pedagogy, we enjoyed rough and tumble play. So for this little boy to make it to the end of four years was a celebration indeed. There was never a question of us excluding or asking him to leave or putting in special measures to support him on his journey to not be a puncher or a kicker or a person that climbed and hung off curtains. We allowed risk. That's something that the Early Years Foundation stage talks about, isn't it? risk. It's something that the non-statutory guidance talks about, isn't it? Risk. So when we think about risks, we think about strategy, we think about ideas and games and things to incorporate. The idea of chess was something that was absolutely, absolutely important for all of my children. So chess tutor Asante, who you see pictured here, was a, a local man in the community who put on chess lessons for children and Asante would come in every year and he would actually facilitate chess lessons for my children, which as I said, was about incorporating strategy uh, and turn taking and thought processes and labeling. So thinking about all of those literacy rich environments, speaking about chess. I thought about the ecosystem of fathers coming in and making sure they were spending time doing what they needed to do with their children. And this young man that you see pictured at the bottom is a father that I had known since he was 14. He became a father in his late teens. And I had known this young man from the community because all black people know each other, don't they? No, they don't, they don't. But the community is really, really well, well, uh, I guess, linked together. So I had known this young man and he had known me for a very long time and he had had a child. And at the point at which his child came to my nursery, I made sure that him as well as lots of other dads came in and spent time with their sons doing things, spent times with their daughters, just doing things. So that was part of the ecosystem. And you'll see a picture also of three little girls looking at images of themselves within a book. Next slide, please. As well as an ecosystem, I thought about pedagogy, of course I did, and I thought about devising my own pedagogy when I thought about the Black Nursery Manager, training and consultancy, anti-racist practice, because everybody likes this, the four E's, the four C's, the ABC's. Thinking about the four E's for me was about ensuring that all settings embraced, embedded, ensured, and extended anti-racist practice. And what those four E's did in creating an environment that ensured that everybody felt like they belonged and truly in the sense of the word of belonging, that it wasn't just paying lip service to having a bolt on or an add on, or that today we're gonna celebrate Diwali. 
today we're going to celebrate Eid. I don't even want to get started on what's happened very recently with the celebrations of Lunar New Year. A whole diaspora's culture being reduced to eating pretend noodles made of wool out of cardboard boxes whilst dressing up as who is perceived to be Chinese. Next slide, please. I often think about where we are as a sector. And I think as early as professionals that we can't afford to position anti-racist practice as an afterthought, because if we do, what will continue to happen is this add on bolt on nature of cultural celebrations of multiculturalism as diversity as a nod to, instead of the embedding of, next slide. I think if we think about what we are presented with for statistics, um, for data, for lived experiences. How often are we listening to the voice of the child? How often are we listening to the voice of those families? How often are we listening to black early years educators and professionals? How often are we sat in a room where we're thinking about and speaking to those practitioners and professionals who are from East and Southeast Asian backgrounds? How often are they informing what we are doing when we are celebrating Lunar New Year? How often are we speaking to the South Asian families that make up our communities? How often are we looking at statistics and applying them to the real life experiences? What is happening in your setting? What's happening in your community? What is happening when you're coming outside of the nursery? There are loads of statistics that I can present you with. There are loads of statistics that you would have seen because you are all people who invest in looking at data. But what happens when you're moving away from that data and applying it to your practice? Because something is missing. There is a link to that chain that isn't connected. So when we look at statistics like this, young black people feel racial stereotypes could negatively impact their academic, academic attainment. 49% of young black people feel that racism is the biggest barrier to attaining success in school, while 50% say the biggest barrier is teacher perceptions of them, for example, being seen as too aggressive. Cue the, oh, I can't believe it, this is awful, this is so shocking, I can't believe this is still happening. And now dismiss, dismiss that shock because the time of shock is gone. It's come and gone, it's time for action again. So when we look at statistics, let's move out of this place of continually, continually being shocked and appalled and upset and saying it's not us, it's them, it's we. We have a joint responsibility, but those educators, those practitioners, those people who are racialized as whites have a level of power because we're looking at structure. And if this is the first time you've kind of come to a conference um, or a talk which has been led by people exclusively that just look like me and Jamal, you know that things need to change. Next slide, please. I want to close my section just by leaving you with a little quote from the, the great Jane Lane, who has done many, many, many years of activism, who I spoke to actually earlier on this week, and she had said she cannot believe we are still having the same conversations. For those of you who don't know Jane Lane, Jane is definitely, definitely um, on the other side of, of 70. And she has been doing this work tirelessly within the early years forever and a day. When she spoke to me earlier on this week and said she cannot believe that she actually feels things are getting worse and not better, she could only um, wish me all the best and told me to keep on fighting the good fight. But when we think about what she's written here about institutionalized bias and its impact on early years provision, think about the words that she said that very few people working with young children would deliberately discriminate against children because they're from a black or other minority ethnic group. But she goes on to acknowledge that institutional racism occurs when people carry on doing what they have always done purely because they've not had the opportunity or the concern to think about the issues involved. I'm gonna hand you over to uh, Jamal for him to carry on the rest of this afternoon's presentation. Yes, Liz, yes, yes, yes. Blessings, blessings, Liz. Um, next slide, please. All right, all right, people. The importance of diversifying early years literacy and provisions. Now, people, we know <clears throat> this has been a turbulent time, a very, very turbulent time, very testing time, especially for those early years 
um, those that work in in the early years field, those that work in early years field in schools, reception classes, and so on. Um, some of us have been having to um, conduct home learning, homeschooling sessions. Um, and yeah, man, just keeping that connect with our families, keeping that connect with our children has been so difficult because they're not here in person. We can't touch, we can't instruct physically, but a lot, you know, that's why we're heroes, you know, because we push and we try our best. For those that have been working in settings, it has been challenging because obviously you're having to social distance, wear PPE, wear masks and conduct our practice, our wonderful practice in, in, in this unusual way where children are having to guess who we are and what we're doing. <laughs> um, and, and we're supposed to maintain a level of, how do you say it, stimulation for our children, motivate, stay motivated ourselves and, and adjust to this new norm. And the main important thing as well is connecting with our families, you know, maintaining those parental relationships, those family relationships, and having a sense of community. Now, the issue I'm going to talk about today, or the issues I'm talking about today, have existed way before this, this, this part, this um, pandemic, this COVID pandemic. Um, and it's to do with the fact that our provisions are not diverse, are not diverse. I've been a practitioner for 19 years, an educator for 19 years, and I've worked, I've walked, worked, walked into different settings, worked in different settings, and when I've looked at their libraries, the libraries are not diverse. They might have one book, and that's the lovely handler surprise, or 10 Little Fingers and 10 Little Toes, which are amazing books, which are amazing books, but there's so much more books to choose from. Now, the books I've got up right now in the presentation, I want you to take a good look at those books and maybe put a little note in the comments to tell me if you have those books in your, in your library. I've gone to settings where they don't have a diverse range of dolls, a, di um, a, a, a diverse range of people for their small world activities, even down to their paints and their crayons. They don't have a diverse range of colors that match skin tone because black people are not black. We come in different shades of brown. And white people are not white. They come in different tones as well. How are we diversifying our provisions and our literacy? And often when we talk about diversity, people often think that you're talking about how can we make it more black? But it's not that. We just wanna be seen. We just wanna be included because we're here. And not just as some part of your tick chart regime. Okay, yep, black book, black doll, Asian doll. Okay, yes, black, no, not part of your tick chart regime because we need to do it because it's important. It's an important part of pedagogy. It's an important part of scaffolding. Look at this lovely range of books. And I've only, I've only put up seven and there's so much more out there. So much more out there. And it hurts when I go into a setting and I'm told our books, black books, are only brought out during Black History Month. Or books with Asian people are only brought out during Chinese New Year or books with my, with, from, cause I'm Trinidadian, books about Diwali are only brought out during Diwali time. These books should be out 
and accessible for children to read throughout the year. Can we go on to the next slide, please? Now, the harsh truth, the harsh truth is, as I said before, most settings do not have a diverse range of literacy in their settings. Cultural or diverse books are only taken out during cultural events or during cultural months. I just said that some settings will only purchase diverse books that are relative to their setting and community, their race, culture, religion, and so forth. Some practitioners and educators will attend workshops and do nothing to diversify their settings, libraries, and resources. They'll just attend, get the certificate, and in a couple months, it will just blow over. Just like the whole Black Lives Movement thing. You know, when everybody was out, out in London last year protesting and so on, everyone turned woke, as they call it. Isn't it, Liz? They turned woke. Everyone turned into this, this freedom fighter, this revolutionist. Where are those people now? We hold discussions about everything else, vaccines, <laughs> Black Lives Matter at the time. People started book groups and so on. People started opening up Facebook groups and so on. Where are you now? Actions speak louder than words. And this practice needs to filter down from those at the top all the way to the guys on the ground. I've read textbooks. I've, worked, I've read academic reports. And only now you see the occasional picture of a black child or maybe a black member of a staff and so on. But why? Are we doing this just to fit the criteria, to look like we're inclusive, to look like we're, you know, displaying anti-racist practice? We're anti-racist, we're not racist. Because often when you do these things, us as black people, we look at you like Kuya. Us as Asian people, we look at you like Kuya. That ain't no anti-racist, you are racist. And we're not pointing the finger at you. We're not cussing you. We're not like, we're not, we're not saying, raw, you know what I mean? You're a bad person or nothing like that because that's the way you've been systematically programmed. I remember having a conversation with an old, old man in a cafe who was reading a newspaper. And he was like, raw, you're different. You're just sitting down, you're, re you're eating your, 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 you know what I mean? Your, your breakfast and so on in the cafe. And he said, you're really different. I said, why am I different? He goes, I'm not, I'm not racist, but you're just different to the colored people that I've met. And I said, wow. I said, bro, you calling me colored is not the way I'd like to be um, <laughs> labeled or, 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 or described as. Yo, I'm an Afro African Caribbean man, born and bred in Lucian. Yes, yeah, so you need to come better, big man. That's racist. So when it comes down to the settings now, and we're having to tell them these, these harsh, these harsh facts, these harsh truths. We're stirring up waters. We're making people upset because they're like, not me. Oh no, not me. As Liz says, it's this, this fragility. This fragility, instead of checking yourself and reflecting on your practice and reflecting how your practice affects the children in your care, because children are the center of all of our practice, you go into this defensive mode. You go into this dis defensive mode. I've spoken to different boards. There's been documents written and these documents have been about inclusion, but they haven't had an inclusive range of authors. And I've had to give them a gentle tap on the shoulder and say, look, there are specialists out there. I've spoken to people on panels about diversity and I had to tell them, look, 
my friend, there are people that are from different races, races out there that fit, you know, that are academics and are suitable to sit on these panels. So we need to do better. Next slide, please. Now, the importance of diversifying the early years literacy and provisions. The National Literacy Trust stated in a report published in 2020, we know that learning to read is a social process. To be successful, you need to connect with your reading material. You need to be able to see yourself and in some way, in, in some way in what you read. The underrepresentation of Black, Asian, minority, ethnic characters means that readers from a range of backgrounds do not make those connections. Now, I loved Harry Potter. I loved the book. But I loved the Nancy even better. I loved the Nancy even better. What about our children? Are they connecting with what you're reading in your settings? In 2003, in a handbook, in Handbook of Early Childhood Literacy published by Sage, Peter Hannon wrote about the deficit model in children's literacy and settings, a model that emphasizes the engagement of families in schools literacy, but not schools in a family's literacy. When have we sat down and asked our families about any special books from their culture, any special stories from their culture. I just named one, and Nancy. In Trinidad, we had a story about this, this boy called Boise. Boise and, um, and Slim. Yeah? Boise and Slim. What do you know about Boise and Slim? We need to be talking to our families. We need to really be sitting down, engaging and engaging with these families and finding out. Because when these children walk into these settings and they're not seeing Boise and they're not seeing Slims and they're not seeing a Nancy, a lot of the time they're lost. They're lost. The Center for Literacy and Primary Education, the CLPE, wrote a report in 2019 that stated only 5% of children's books published in the UK had a black, Asian, or ethnic minority main character. In 2017, this was 1%. This was 1% people. So that means that animals were represented more than black people, Asian people and other ethnic minorities. Next slide, please. In the birth, the birth to five matters, the new birth to five matters. Yeah. It says emotional health and well-being in the emotional health and well-being part of factors which influence development. It says children need to feel valued, psychologically secure, safe, supported, and loved in order to develop and learn. So if we're not connecting with the children and they don't feel safe, and they don't feel secure, that's gonna affect their development. There's other parts there about community, there's a part there about experiences in the world, and if we're not giving children a true representation of the world through our provisions and literacy, we are doing them a great injustice. And I wrote at the bottom a little quote, our practice, provisions, and settings shape the way our children view and interact with the world. Next, please. All right, cool. So this is my, I gave some steps there about how to make simple but impactful change. Acknowledging diversity, regardless of that diversity being recognized or present in your setting. Some people think because in their, their, their setting there's no black people, you don't need black books, you definitely do. Because what happens is your child goes out into the big broad community and then when they, they go into the inner cities, they stumble upon a black person, they're surprised, they're shocked. And that helps, that, that then causes a knock on effect and builds on that, that racial bias, that builds on that, that the, the, the discrimination and it ain't helping no one guys. Make an effort to diversify your settings, literacy, creating diverse learning experiences and themes. 
create an environment that embraces diversity and culture, providing a diverse range of literature and provisions with representation in mind, celebrating festivals culture, but being mindful of tokenism. And do your research. Me and Liz are not gonna feed you our research, we're not. We're not gonna give you our presentations all the time. You need to want it yourself. And the last point is each one teach one. Share what you've learned today with others. Don't just keep it with just to yourself, all right? And next slide, I think that's the end. <laughs> Now the next slide is um it's me and you together because we yes about some of the things that we had discovered and actually just to give you a backstory me and Jamal did not know each other have not actually even met in person we found one another through the um the magic of the internet social mm -hmm. media so when people are coming to us and be like how do we find this how do we find that what books should we get what you know where should we go for further research and reading and me and Jamal will always conversate about the fact that when people are coming to us to ask us in the same way we found one another you can also go and find other people who share your values have a common interest in what it is that you want to achieve in the early years and form meaningful relationships because yes. this meaningful relationship that me and jamal have created started in the as many of these conversations and, and relationships did actually jamal the summer yeah. of 2020 the summer of 2020 is going to go down in history because it was a time of connection. But we talked about some of the documentation that had been coming out. And one of the things that really struck us was the Building Futures Believing in Children National Strategies document, which was first published, I think it was 2009. It talks about mm -hmm. a focus on provision for black children in the early years. And guess what, guys? We're still saying the same thing in 2021. All yeah. of the information that's in this document is absolutely brilliant, on point, empowering, excellent. It is the go-to, it is our reference document. And me and Jamal had gone through it. Me and Shadow had spoken about it and we were like, oh, okay. Nothing, nothing's, nothing's really changed, has it? This information is there and it's still not being taken notice of. So that document, get it, download it, read it, very important. Young and Black, this is where the statistics were taken from, from my part of the presentation from the YMCA. The young black experience of institutional racism in the UK. Some of you like to think that this only happened, um, you know, in schools. Uh, a lot of conversation around decolonizing in school curriculums. Guess what? Before the children get to school, they're sometimes in early years provisions. Don't think that the mask of kindness is hiding your racism. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. And then obviously the document that Jamal was talking about, reflecting realities, where it gave you those stark statistics where everybody was like, oh, there's no black characters in children's books. Hello. You know, it just makes me wonder where's everybody been throughout this time? Where has everybody been? One of the things that I wanna kind of bring your attention to as we talk about the reflecting realities is one of the books that I think, or a series of books, which has been really instrumental. I've got it to hand, so I'm gonna put it in front of the um, camera. There are six of these books that were produced by Lady Bird, Sure Start, sorry, not Sure Start, Sun Starts. But sure start is still relevant. But yes. these ladybird books, um, really interesting because obviously they were written yesteryear. Uh, but some of the information that's in these books about life in the Caribbean, written in what I would say is a very respectful way, but in a way that really draws on other lived experiences. And it is a series of books that I would absolutely recommend you you find, get on eBay contact um lady bear books uh, and have a look so the slides are finished jamal has combed out his beard we spoke yeah with... man my beard's nice and calm it is soft as well you know to i put some share butter in it <laughs> <laughs> to hopefully motivate but um thank you thank you so much for listening and for engaging and for being here this afternoon because you could have been anywhere else i'll hand it back over to shadow yes man big up yourself Thank you so much, Liz and Jamal. That was really fantastic. Um, we've had lots of great discussion and comments on the board. I think there was really good conversation going on in relation to children literacy. Um, you know what what you're saying was really really important, and I think a lot of people in this room will be feeling quite uncomfortable with what you've been saying. Um, this might be the first time that you've you know had these conversations and listened to this sort of stuff, but. 
I think for certainly what you're saying is that, you know, we're having these conversations now, so we don't have to be having them again in 10 years time because we've been going through this for so long. Um, and it's frustrating to look at the state of things 10 years ago, you know, and the state of racism, which has only really increased in the past decade, and especially in relation to the Black Lives Matter movement last year. So this is really effective stuff. Um, and, you know, it's a deeply personal issue, but I think you know, it has heavy resonances, specifically in the Scottish context. Um, Liz, I don't know if you want to come in or Kirsten with a, with a question or comment. Liz Latto, sorry, not Liz Pemberton. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was an incredibly dynamic presentation. Um, it was entertaining and shocking and uncomfortable. Uh, I'll hold my hands up and say that as an academic, as an early years practitioner, as an early years teacher, this is the first uh, seminar or CPD that I've ever been at that's been led uh, by someone who looks like either yourself, Liz, or yourself, Jamel. Um, it's incredibly powerful. And I think that if we're uncomfortable with these questions and these conversations, and if we've not actually thought about this sort of thing before, then that certainly points to our own white privilege. Uh, you know, if it's not something we've had to worry about before, then that really reflects on uh, our own white privilege. Um, so thank you. Uh, it's been incredible. Uh, looking at some of the chat that we've been going through, um, there's been some absolutely fantastic comments. Now, I may mispronounce your name, I'm afraid. Uh, Khadija? Khadija? Um, That's correct, uh, Liz. That is correct. Um, um, so, you know, who's commented, you know, it is really easy for people to stand up and to speak in solidarity, but we need to see more tangible change and action. Uh, would either yourself, Liz, or Jamil want to sort of respond to that? What sort of things would you actually like to see people doing to, to actually step up? I think there's a conversation to be had around the amplification and advocacy and allyship and what people are now understanding by the words allyship, advocacy, amplification. And when we think about showing solidarity to other marginalized communities outside of racism. So, for example, when I think about the rife homophobia that exists within the early years space, I think about the fact that as a black woman, part of another minoritized or marginalized group, it is imperative and important for me to show solidarity to our LGBTQ community. It is important that we recognize and demonstrate within our early year spaces, we must amplify those voices too. And I do that by ensuring that I don't just share posts, I don't just speak openly about it, but I make sure that I put myself in the most uncomfortable situations, understanding that it is very culturally normal within Black African Caribbean communities to talk openly and homophobically, and to put myself in a position where, as a member of that community, I speak openly about not being homophobic, that's just as uncomfortable as white people sitting here today thinking, oh no, they've said white, they've said black, they've said black, they've said white. <laughs> it is about allowing yourself to be as vulnerable and being comfortable with being vulnerable and being open to criticism because we are not always going to get it right. But I always say, do not let the fear of getting things wrong stop you from speaking truth to power. Yes. And can I, can I add to that, Liz? Go. You know, Definitely, I feel like yeah, the vul the vulnerability is a big thing, um, and going out there and actually just actively calling a spade a spade, you know, a lot of us are actually scared to do that, and we'll talk behind closed doors, send a message behind closed doors, but it's about standing um, together and 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 having a unified voice, you know, often. There might be someone that's that's tried to have you say it gaslight me and Liz will jump in and be like no this is this is one of my brothers here do you know what I mean this is someone that I admire this is someone that I respect how dare you jump in and jump on them or talk to them in that way you know when what they're saying is actually justified it's actually right you know and that's what it's about and it's about solidarity and it's about being bold I mean, I, I love uh, uh, how you're saying it's about being bold. You'd mentioned uh, earlier on about manners shielding racism and about being polite. 
um, I don't know if anybody else has a question about this, but would you like to kind of respond about the very British uh, good manners actually hiding that sort of systemic uh, racism? Yeah, I think the way in which it's been masked, particularly the, the cover that early years has really successfully used is just always talking about kindness, except for racism. Don't talk about racism, just talk about being kind. And actually we grow our children to be nice to one another. But are we having conversations with our four-year-olds and our five-year-olds about why we should be kind? What is kindness about? When we start pulling that thread, what does it look like when it when it pertains to matters around racial injustice, you know? And I think when we're thinking about the dialogue and the framework and the racial literacy that we don't have within the sector, it means that we can comfortably move away from just not having the conversation. And that is where the danger lies. Because there is no racial literacy or there is an unwillingness to have the conversation within the sector, it means that the conversation is masked and brushed over. And if you're seen to be speaking about it, Oh, here we go again, Liz with the race stuff. Oh, here we go again, Jamal talking about black people in books. Oh God, here's another one now. We've got a white one talking about it, advocating, being an ally because it's on trend. Oh, the woke brigade. So everything gets dismissed. And then what happens to some people is that it becomes a thing where, can we be bothered to talk about it? Should we still be talking about it? Should we still be advocating? Because now we're being labeled as troublemakers. Now we're being labeled as having the big mouth. When you're speaking truth to power, it encourages other people to be bold. Other people that share in your vision and share in your power um, to, to speak out against injustice. And absolutely, I see somebody said in the comments, nothing happens in the comfort zone, nothing. And it requires you to actually step out and be in spaces like this. Me and Jamel are always in spaces where we're one of two or three black faces on a Zoom screen. That in itself, it's a problem, but it happens all the time, every yep. day. Um, yep. I'm supposed to sit there comfortably and just be like, oh, okay, yeah, this is, this, is, this is very normal. Children like to see themselves reflected. The professionals in this sector also would like to see themselves reflected and not just in a, you know, as Jamal said, a tokenistic way, but in a way where we're adding value and we're, we're impacting change structurally. Um, hence why, as I said, I stepped out of nursery management and stepped into consultancy to start being um, one of a few other black faces on a Zoom screen. More visible. <laughs> Just like, more visible, I'm here, yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and you know what, yeah, I feel like, and this is an important takeaway for everybody that's that's present right now, yeah, is that in early years, we do hold uncomfortable conversations when it comes to safeguarding and child protection and FGM and so forth. And I feel like the same attention should be paid to anti-racist practice and real inclusive practice. And that training just like this needs to be done annually. It needs to be put on websites or calling people like myself and Liz or Pran or whoever it is, you know, to come in and, and talk and, and share the practice because, you know, there is a, um, how do you say it? Because this whole society, England's structure has been built on racism, you know, it's always going to be a relevant topic. Or, or an issue that needs to be addressed. This is something that has been built in to, well, from our children, from the early years till now. And there's, there's people that know, know better, you know, and they should know better. And we'll shake them up and do that. So let's make it annual. So, so, not, so ignorance is no excuse. You know, the, the fact no. that you don't know is no excuse. No, no. Um, I think as well, sorry to cut you, but I, I, I always think about this ignorance. And I think when my granddad came here in 1954, when he came to this country from Jamaica, he came to the motherland and was treated in such a disgusting, despicable way, as many people of the Windrush generation were. And mm -hmm. then his daughter came here. Um, and then his granddaughter was born here. And his granddaughter mm -hmm. is here in this Zoom call today in 2021, having the mm -hmm. same conversation. No, ignorance is not bliss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ignorance is not bliss and it's not acceptable but what's happening is that as i said more people are feeling empowered to speak truth to power and also are not afraid of the consequences i always think about the price for freedom in this situation is often death 
that's the reality. And if it's not death that's caused by structural racism, i.e. COVID, it's death that's caused by abuse, it's mental, it's emotional, it's death that's caused at the intersection of your identity as a black woman. I know that I face more risk being in social media spaces, speaking truth to power, than a black man like Jamal does. But I understand the power of me jumping in when those things happen. So I understand exactly the complexities of my identity and the intersections, but I know ignorance absolutely ignorance is not an excuse we can't all be here living in this blind state of being not in the early years yeah absolutely thank you for that Liz I mean I, I always think that if we think about how uncomfortable talking about racism is think about how uncomfortable racism is you know as a, you know beyond those conversations trying to live through racism in our daily lives is so so difficult um, I'm conscious of time so I hope you'll all join me in kind of virtually clapping for Liz and Jamel it's been really nice to see you both here today um, please do follow us on Twitter and I'll put Liz and Jamel's Twitter links on online as well um, we look forward to seeing you all at our next event in June so those of you who are part of our mailing list will get information regarding to that thank you for joining us today bye everyone lessons all